It's October 30 today and I'm excited to be going for a walk at our local wildlife center. It has many, many trails and it's a favorite among the locals because it's a very popular um, bird route, second only to the coast. There is 17,000 acres of wetlands to explore here and for the birds to call their home as they're passing through. So it is a pretty amazing place. We get swans here and all kinds of geese and ducks and mergansers and buffleheads. I don't know my birds that well, but I do hang out with people that are birders. So I'm blessed to learn slowly what things are. But if you are a birder, you must come visit the Creston Valley. It is prime. The Wildlife Center is open in the spring and summer and you can go on canoe tours through all the little channels here. This weekend we had a heritage church service and it was a pretty wonderful experience. We all got together and dressed up like we were in the 1800s and kind of remembered what our roots were from. There was this Baptist guy named William Miller and he fought in the War of 1812. And when he came home from the war, he really started searching and thinking about the meaning of life. One Sunday, the preacher, the regular preacher couldn't be in church. So William was asked if he would read the sermon. And as he was reading it, he got really touched and really emotional because it was about the roles and responsibilities of a parent. He said, Suddenly, the character of a savior was vividly impressed upon my mind. It seemed that there might be a being so good and compassionate as to himself atone for our transgressions and thereby save us from suffering the penalty of sin. I immediately felt how lovely such a being must be and imagined that I could cast myself into the arms of and trust in the mercy of such a one. After that experience, he got really deep into Bible study and he discovered that Christ's second coming was prophesied in the Bible. And he took his beliefs um, from Daniel 8, 14, which says unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And so he eventually decided uh, that he could figure out what that date was that Jesus was going to come. He had about 20 years to um, formulate his ideas and get people, um, other people studying about it. And at first they came up with 1843, but then Jesus didn't come. And so then they came up with March 1844 and Jesus didn't come. And then April and then August and still Jesus didn't come. And finally, another guy came forward and said, you know what? It's going to be October 22, 1844. So everybody was so excited and fervent in prayer and they sold all their possessions and just got ready for Jesus to come. And it wasn't just a North American phenomena. Other people in other countries got on board too. And they got really excited.
Jesus didn't come and so people were so sad there was so much weeping happening and it's known as the great disappointment and people gave up on God and left the church I guess they didn't read the verse in the Bible that talks about if you knew when a thief was going to break into your house then of course you would be on the watch and you would be looking for that thief and you wouldn't let him break into your house so the Son of Man is coming at an hour when no one expects. From that disappointment, a small group of people got together and studied and they realized that that verse in Daniel was still an important verse, but it just didn't mean that Jesus was going to come on that day. They got the date right, but the event was wrong because yeah, nobody can predict a date or stay a date when Jesus will return. So from that group of people, my church developed and emerged, and that's how we have our roots, our foundation. You just wonder what they're talking to each other about out there. Probably gossiping or something. No, ducks wouldn't do that. So have you ever experienced any major disappointment in life? A few weeks ago, I told you about my parents' divorce. And of course, when they divorced, they put their place up for sale and somebody was going to buy it. And then just as that was about to take place, my home in town sold. So I took that as a sign that perhaps I should buy the farm. And so I did, I got out a mortgage for it and my dad carried the rest of the um, price so I could pay it back to him when, he, when I sell it. It's been in our family for 30 years and I thought it would be good to keep the family unit together for a while because my dad wanted to live in a trailer on the farm for a couple years. So that was a whole other story. Anyway, I fixed it up, put a lot of money into fixing it up, and now I've had it on the market for four and a half years. First, I was trying to sell it on my own, and then I put it with a realtor for almost a year, and that wasn't doing anything, so I took it off and lowered the price, and it still is not selling, and God knows how desperately we need that money. So yeah, that's what I'm struggling with right now. And I guess it all boils down to the fact that it takes faith. I pray to God to please sell it and then I have to leave it in his care and trust that his will will be done. So I pray for that every day. And then if it does ever sell, then I will know that it is from God and his timing. So that's why we have to pray in everything, pray without ceasing. I heard a really good sermon once that has really struck home for me. The preacher said that God is, we need to have faith no matter what in the little things or the big things. And that is what will see us through the time just before he comes when, the, when things get really difficult and all we have is to rely on God. This testing time now that we are going through makes us stronger and more prepared for the end of the, of the world for just before Jesus comes. So I take comfort in that. I just have to put my trust in him that he will not um, fail me and that his will is done. Paul says that we are sanctified by faith in Jesus. And a great hiking verse that I claim is that we walk by faith, not by sight. Another good verse is that we are saved by faith and that not of ourselves, it is a gift of God. So the whole moral of the stories that I've told you today and this trek is that I don't want you to be discouraged or deeply disappointed 
and how you think things should go. The expectations that you have aren't necessarily the expectations that God has. So we have to put our trust in God and be patient in Him. The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So keep your eyes looking upward. And until my next epic adventure, assalamu alaikum, shalom, peace.